uh, Professor Audrey Kobayashi here uh, for her public lecture of Seeking Justice in the Downtown East Side. My name is Kirsten McAllister. I'm in the School of Communication at Simon Fraser University. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to start by acknowledging the territory. After that, I'm going to hand it over to Professor, Professor Nicholas Bromley, who will introduce Professor Audrey Kobayashi. <laughs> So, um, to acknowledge the territory, we're on the t unceded territory of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Salvatore nations. So it's a great uh, privilege to be here on their territory as visitors. Um, it's, I, and I think it's very appropriate that um, the, the, the research and the collaboration that uh, Professor uh, Kowayashi is going to discuss today is taking place on this territory. Um, <coughs> professor Wongi is a professor of geography at Simon Fraser University, Kennedy, Nokia, and um, he's known um, as a leader in the field of geography and law. Uh, he has not just many book publications and other publications from expanding spaces of law to rights of passage, sidewalks, and regulation of public flow, and setting the, center, uh, set the city, urban land, and the politics of property and on. But he's also known for his activism and his collaboration of, on issues of great import regarding social justice. So we're very privileged to have him at our university. So I'll hand over the introductions. Uh, wonderful to uh, see you all. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Audrey, for being here. It's wonderful to, to have you uh, back. Um, uh, I'm just say a few quick words about uh, Audrey, and because we've just been a lot longer talking about uh, Audrey. Um, but we should say welcome back because Audrey is from BC. She's, uh, she's a BC gal. Uh, she completed her BA and MA at some university in Vancouver, west of here. Um, <laughs> and did very well. And then she went and did a PhD at UC, UCLA. And she's, she taught at McGill, sorry, before, before moving to, uh, to, uh, to, to Queens. And if you go to her website, you will find that she has a CV that is 55 pages long, single space. And it's actually out of date. You need to update it. <laughs> so it's, but it should be longer. Um, uh, it's, and it's, it, the reason it's very long is because uh, it, Audrey's uh, work is, uh, is voluminous and, uh, and rich. Uh, she, um, she's also highly distinguished. Most, rec most recently, as far as I know, I may have missed this, is uh, she was awarded, uh, she was uh, given the title of AAG Fellow in 2017, which is a, a distinguished award. She's also been the president of the American Association of Geographers and the Canadian Association of Geographers. So the Mexicans next, and then she's got the American uh, wrapped up. Uh, she was also the editor of the um, uh, AAAG, the Amazon Association of American Geographers, and the author of numerous, uh, numerous wonderful books. Most recently, how many volumes? Seven, ten? International Encyclopedia? Fifteen. Fifteen volume Encyclopedia of Human Geography, geography with a couple of other uh, colleagues. Uh, she also wrote a book with Suzanne McKenzie called Remaking Human Geography, which has been reissued um, yeah. uh, in a wonderful book. Uh, and also uh, co-edited a book called Rethinking the Great White North, which is uh, also, just also fantastic. Um, so Audrey's research, really, uh, as, as, as I would describe it, centers on questions of, of human differentiation, about race, class, gender, ability, <coughs> identity and thinking intersectionally about those um, and exploring the way in which they're expressed in everyday landscapes like the home, uh, streets, workplaces and so on. And her voice uh, has been an incredibly powerful and consistent and articulate one uh, for, uh, for, for many years and pointing in particular to me to, to both silences and oppressions. And, um, uh, oppressions and silences in terms of sort of everyday lived geographies but also institutional silences. So, um, we're, and with Eugene uh, McCann here, we're, we're uh, contributing to a book on the uh, history of uh, radical geography uh, and, and Audrey's piece, as uh, Robert Wright uh, is, is focused on the, kind of the whiteness of, of, of the discipline as, as well as the, the important um, uh, voices, minority geographers um, in, the, in, in previous years. So her work is, 
is incredibly sophisticated, so she's engaged with people like Sartre and Fanon, um, but it's also highly grounded and uh, empirically grounded, uh, so some of her early work is a very detailed genealogical database of, of uh, Japanese Canadian uh, immigrants, which we're trying to deconstruct, I think, uh, even now, uh, because of its significance. And what's also important is that, is that she's, of course, a distinguished academic, but her work is, is, is grounded in, in lived context, in lived struggles, in policy, on existing uh, legal and legislative frameworks that enable social change. Uh, so she's an active citizen in all sorts of ways, both to the discipline and uh, to, the, to the world more generally. So uh, we are lucky to, to have her here. And I'm also very privileged in that I'm uh, working with her on actually two research projects, one which is the Landscapes of Injustice project, another which is the Right to Remain project. Jeff Masuda here is, is uh, with Audrey and are leading that. And we have some folk here from that, so welcome to those uh, folk. And I was just trying to talk with Audrey about when we first met, and we're not quite sure, but it was some time uh, in the last century. Um, but I have a memory of meeting Audrey uh, fairly early on when I moved to Vancouver. I remember we met in Gastown, and we had a cup of tea. And uh, uh, it was wonderful because Audrey was explaining to me, in a sense, the place that I had moved to, and explaining some of the, uh, the history of the place that I uh, came to. And she. She gave me this little book, which some of you may have seen. If you haven't, you should find it. Um, uh, I think it's been reprinted or re-edited. Um, well, it needs to be rewritten yeah. before it can be reprinted. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, it, so it's very valuable. Um, it's a very valuable resource. It's, it's a, out of print, yes. Yeah. Out, out of print. It's called Memories of Our Past, A Brief History and Walking Tour of, of Powell Street. And I thought it would be germane just to say a few words from that text, because um, from what I understand, your presentation is going to speak to not just Powell Street and the Powell Guide, but the kind of history of dispossession uh, in this place. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a guided tour of, of Powell Street, but it's much more than that. And, uh, it begins, once upon a time there was a place called Powell Street. Until 1942, Powell Street was a thriving neighborhood and the social and economic center for Japanese Canadians throughout the, the province. It contained the stores, schools, factories, churches and homes of nearly half of the 22,000 Japanese Canadians at the time. It contained, sorry, it also contained all the tensions, hates, grudges and hardships that life has to offer any community and it suffered throughout its history the racist prejudices of other Vancouverites. Japanese Canadians were banished from Powell Street in 1942, uprooted from their homes and dispossessed of their community, their human and civil rights, their sense of belonging to a place that they had created and inhabited with hope and vitality and determination. Today's relic landscape still bears the tragedy of the uprooting and dispossession of the Japanese Canadians who were its major architects. And then she goes on, as you make your way through Powell Street, you should not overlook even if you could, today's population. This is 1992. Despite the nostalgic return in recent years of a few Japanese Canadian businesses and community groups, Powell Street now has a much more diverse population, most of whom have limited income and incomes, many of whom, because of their differences or their disabilities, are marginalized from the mainstream that is often tough and intolerant. Spend a few minutes on a bench in Powell Ground, Oppenheimer Park as it is now, it will become very clear that this new community has its own vibrancy and rhythm in a place that is as much home as Powell Street ever was to Japanese Canadians. This community is also undergoing a dispossession, daily eroded as the pressures of rising property values <laughs> yield more and more building, buildings to the address of the developers. So, uh, <laughs> Audrey, thank you very much. <coughs> thank the floor you. is yours. I wrote it in 1992. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's absolutely wonderful um, to be here. Um, let, me, let me start by saying that I take Kirsten's acknowledgement very seriously. Um, and it is more than an acknowledgement that we are visiting on unceded territory, much more. Um, because I, I want to start by saying that the story of oppression and human rights in the downtown east side has always been about dispossession and injustice um, toward First Peoples. Um, and it's true to, as true today as it was in the mid-19th century um, when the area 
that we now know as Vancouver uh, was first settled by European colonizers. So what I want to talk about, the whole project, and it's a project over a number of many years, um, it has always been about home, the idea of home and uh, what this, how this place is home uh, to different peoples. Uh, but before I do that, I want to say that even though I'm here speaking, this is a big collaborative project that I want to come to in a few minutes. And um, that, that actually half the people who are writing it are in this room. So I want to ask them to all stand up. All the people from the collaborative, please stand up. <laughs> much too modest. Um, uh, anyway, that's your choice. <laughs> um, uh, just as long as you know that there are, there are people here who are very involved and who are the foundation of the project that I'm going to get to probably in about 15 minutes. Um, and, and they're the whole reason that this is here. And it's just such a pleasure to look out and see some people that I've known for a very long time. Terry's the oldest. <laughs> I mean, the oldest friend. <laughs> um, I believe I could, I could be wrong. Um, and uh, people, uh, there are a lot of geographers here. And I use the term geographer for uh, any academic who's doing interesting work. So <laughs> <laughs> that covers up everybody. Uh, quite a few from Simon Fraser, quite a few geographers, quite a few members of the local community, quite a few Japanese Canadians, and some people who are all three. So um, it's a really interesting, fun group that's assembled here, and therefore I can I feel that I can take license to be pretty informal. Um, including having lost the first two slides, and I can't seem to make it go backwards, so that's all right. Um, I, I'm going to start by doing something that's just a little bit autobiographical, because I don't like to do that. Uh, but I, I want to just take you back for just a minute to what it was like to be a student at that place a little west of here. Uh, but actually, I'm also an alumna of Simon Fraser because I took two courses at Simon Fraser. <laughs> yeah, one from Michael Elliott Hurst uh, and one from Phil Wagner. So you know, you know when that was. Um, but those were very turbulent times. Um, even if I was at the other place and not at Radical Youth, which is a great book. Um, in the early 1970s, uh, lots of us were, you know, children of the 60s, and we did all of the things that children of the 60s did. Um, so my education was very much in the activist tradition, for which I am very grateful. So my master's advisor was David Lay, and uh, I remember that up on, some others of you in the room might have seen this, on his, the wall, outside of his door, was a map made out of push pins. Did you see it? You, was it there when you were? Probably not. <coughs> so it was a map of Vancouver with push pins showing all the boarding houses, and then this mass around Powell Street. You have seen it. I hope there's a photograph or something, because I think it's been dismantled. And I would walk past this map every day and didn't notice it for a little while. And then one day I looked at it and I realized those are all of what were called boarding houses. We'll now call them SROs. And most, a lot of those were actually built by Japanese Canadians. So Powell Street is um, a place that has seen many occupations. Um, why did, why are all those buildings there that were built by Japanese names? That was a, you know, I was an undergraduate when I saw this and I couldn't quite figure it out. So I decided I would, you know, spend a career trying to figure it out. <laughs> that was the beginning of the 1970s, okay? And um, this is, that's what I've been doing ever since, trying to figure out that map <laughs> that was on David Lay's wall. 
Um, but they were turbulent times. So, uh, during the 1970s, um, I, I was taken uh, to Powell Street uh, by uh, a, a dear friend, Warren Gill, who many of you may have known. He passed away a couple of years ago. He was a member of the geography department here. And I was an undergraduate. Warren was a graduate student. And he took us on a field trip to Powell Street. And he didn't, you know, all he talked about was the fact that Japanese Canadians used to live here. I mean, that's what he was taught at the time. He didn't say anything about all of the people who lived there at the time, which was early 1970s. So it was a very different place than, than it is now. Um, and it was those two things that sort of got me interested. But the other thing, and here's where Roy Miki comes into this story. Do you remember the Powell Street Review? Yeah. yeah. So that was 74, 75, 6? 76. 76. Uh, so a, a new generation of what would be uh, Japanese Canadian scholars, writers, etc. Uh, were beginning to express their interest in their background a little bit different. And uh, there was Joy Kogawa, Rick Shiomi, Roy Kiyoka, Roy Miki. Um, um, I was there with some silly stuff. Um, and quite a few others um, who started writing about Japanese Canadians and their history and doing it with an activist bent, which of course is the point. Um, this was not separate from the community. Uh, and then um, 1977 came along and it was the centennial of the arrival of the first Japanese Canadian um, or Japanese immigrant to Canada. And the whole country organized uh, and sort of culminated in the first Powell Street Festival. I imagine most of the people in the room have attended the Powell Street Festival. It's very different now than, than it was then. And uh, the first street dress meetings, the first meetings to organize, um, to attempt to get a redress settlement. And um, I remember going to a meeting uh, at Aki's, and I think Roy was there at the, at the same time. I don't think anybody else in the room was alive. <laughs> uh, but um, this would have been 77 that that happened. But prior to that time, there had been all sorts of stuff going on with uh, an attempt to institutionalize Powell Street. Uh, Tonari Gumi as a drop-in center, Sakura So as a senior's um, residence. And there were vestiges of Japanese Canadian culture a few commercial um, establishments, uh, none of which are there now. Only the Powell Street Festival carries on, and as well as the Buddhist Temple and the Language School. Uh, but people come flocking to Powell Street every day, and or every year rather, to celebrate something that is that was an important set of memories, and is less and less a memory that actually resides in the minds of the people who go there. So, all that to say, not only that I had this long-term plan uh, that started when I was fairly young, uh, but that at the time I had no idea just how significant it might be, or that you could actually build a career on it. <laughs> um, so, uh, having, okay, so you have there a map of sort of the next stage. I left um, Vancouver with another plan in mind. Uh, I, I went to uh, UCLA and I sort of said, well, if I'm going to understand Powell Street, and that's how I thought of it in my head, understanding Powell Street, I need to understand what came before Powell Street. So I had a plan that I would write a PhD thesis um, on what happened back in Japan before immigration. And um, so, you know, I did various things. I, I did that. And so I just thought I'd show you uh, a couple of pictures. Um, this is 
the place in Japan where I did my PhD research, I won't tell you about that research except to say that it involved a massive amount of data, 15,000 land transactions and every birth, death, marriage and migration for uh, 150 households in this village. Um, that was called demography and we did not have computers. <laughs> so uh, I did all that. I, I, I wrote a, a thesis and um, also something that is very interesting in retrospect, I, I was fascinated with Jean-Paul Sartre and his philosophy and tried to base an understanding of community. So my, my PhD thesis was about trying to understand the basis of community. I wouldn't say that I got all that far, but you know, it was just sort of starting. So this is the place. Um, this the village is actually right here on a river that occasionally flooded, and this is where the geography comes in. The river would flood, it would inundate the fields, people would starve, and they had to go somewhere. So where did they go? They went to Vancouver. And this is the source of the largest number of immigrants from Japan to Vancouver. Um, this set of villages on this place called the Koto Plain. There were other, I think I, the next one shows, just making a move. Um, okay, there's another, uh, another perspective and, and you can, the geographers in the room will recognize this. Um, the particular geomorphology of the place that, that explains why people left. Um, and just to prove I really am a geographer, there is another map. <laughs> <laughs> and this only shows uh, male immigrants, partly because it was originally male immigrants who went to Canada, and um, partly because we don't have uh, very good data on women. That's the way it was. So. Um, Thousands of people left um, from this set of villages in this concentrated uh, part of Japan, and those uh, places are known in Japanese as Iminmura or immigrant villages. And here's another interesting thing for the political economists in the room: a traditional Japanese village has one big house, and it is surrounded by a bunch of little thatched cottages. And you go into this village and all the houses look like this. They're all built um, during the late Meiji or mostly during the Taisho period so that after uh, around the first two uh, decades of the 20th century uh, and there are a lot of monuments and all sorts of indications that this, is, that this couldn't possibly be a traditional Japanese village because there isn't enough land for all those rich people, basically. Um, so um, that's when my interest in architecture started, as I began to study these houses and figure out what are the details and what it is about the quotidian of, uh, pattern of movement um, through the village and what it means to, uh, to fake being a landowner when you couldn't possibly be a landowner in that political economy. So there's, it's a very long story and I'd love to talk about it, but, but I won't. Uh, except to say that what is so fascinating is to understand the strength of community and what it meant to the people who came from these villages to become, to gain status in their communities by building these houses and, and erecting whole bunch of uh, 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 statues and Buddhist altars and gardens. These are very, very beautiful gardens. What it means to gain that status, but to do so as a community, not as just individuals here and there scattered all over the place, but as a real community uh, living together, as they do today. I visited, actually Jeff came with me, we visited last year, and the village doesn't look very much different, except it now has a stoplight. So, um, within the established paradigm of historical geography, this was a, a little bit different, at least it seemed a little bit different. I um, then, 
got a job at McGill, and uh, I said, okay, I've got the first desktop computer in the department, and probably almost the first in the whole university, um, in 1983. Uh, they had just started making them. <laughs> Um, and, a, and a 32K IBM computer cost $5,000, but I had a grant. Um, so I said, well, I've got to understand these demographics. So I started gathering information. I went to the archives. I traveled all over Japan. I, I was just crazy. And I found 40,000 people who had emigrated from Japan to Canada. And a very large number of them uh, went to Powell Street. And if they didn't live on Powell Street, they would go there and they would stay in one of these places that provided accommodation for short periods of time. And at the same time that, that these places provided accommodation, they provided a job, uh, whether in Vancouver in the sawmills, that was the largest source of, of employment, or somewhere in the province in forestry and mining and railway building in farming, um, and they provided translation, did I say that? They organized the, the, the labor force entirely. They sent remittances back to Japan. Um, and if you go to the archives, you'll find that they were all pool halls. And the reason for that is that the uh, city of Vancouver, in a very discriminatory way, came down upon Powell Street and said, uh, we have to get these people organized somehow, account for them, but the only license that they, that they had at their disposal, this would be in 1906 to 1909, was a pool hall license. So you have a whole street full of pool halls. So that, you know, the lesson of that is that you really have to be able to read the archives to know what is going on. So here is a street of pool halls, which I knew were doing very different things besides maybe some of them playing pool or other things. So uh, anyway, so it just you know, fix in your mind this picture of the traditional village. It's all about labor. It's all about going to Vancouver, where one could earn seven times what one could earn in Japan, and go back and buy not just a house, buy a way of life, buy a, a sense of community. Uh, that is what this was all about. So this is where they came. And I've just put together a bunch of pictures of early Vancouver, which many of you will be uh, familiar with, um, until I believe this is the latest one. And, and I won't go into explaining all of the details. Some of you will know them if you study Vancouver. The tall ships, of course, uh, came into the harbor. They, um, they took on lumber. Vancouver was the world's largest supplier in the world of toothpicks. Um, <laughs> and very proud of the fact. Uh, and then eventually the trains arrived in 1887. Vancouver was incorporated in 1886. In 1887 the trains arrived and Vancouver became this place that was sending toothpicks all over the place. And actually in Japan there's a really big market for toothpicks. Um, to Japan, sending them east, sending them everywhere. And of course not just toothpicks. They, uh, the Hastings Mill was the, the largest employer and uh, Japanese immigrant men became the largest uh, ethnic group working at the Hastings Mill. They apparently lived on scows in, in the <coughs> in the bay, uh, which is also where, at that time, there was a very uh, significant First Nations community. Um, and there are some pictures of, of that community. And um, the scows were there, sort of floating in the water. And I guess pretty horrible. They would be able to get on uh, a canoe and go across the water to what is now called Gastown. Uh, which was a very good place to drink. Um, and then, of course, they had to go back across the water. Um, and so the arrival of Japanese immigrants was concurrent with the industrialization of Vancouver. Uh, 
the, that is the definition of the start of the Japanese Canadian community. But there's no way that all of them wanted to stay in this industrial landscape. And it's there is a kind of mythology that says, well, they all came here, they didn't want to go back to Japan. To Japan. Well, they did want to go back to Japan, to those beautiful houses, but only the first sons could do that. And so, uh, the Japanese Canadian community became a community of second and third stunts who stayed uh, and who wanted to establish whatever opportunities they could in Canada. Now, of course, that's simple and they were simplistic. There were lots of other um, individual stories, but that's basically the main um, narrative. And they moved from the Scows to Alexander Street, where they uh, rented. Uh, premises. Um, you may know that Alexander Street was originally a very middle-class street um, and then it was taken over uh, by the sex industry and that was really a problem for straight-laced white Vancouver. Tried to get them out um, but it's one of the first examples of white flight. Alexander Street was vacated Powell Street uh, was built, uh, and there was nothing beyond that at first. Um, then Hastings Street, after Powell Street, and then uh, a lot of empty space up to Pender Street, where Chinese immigrants live. And as quickly as possible, one of the in, in, in a very rapid process of suburbanization that I also won't talk about in much detail. But the the white middle class uh, owners of the houses started moving up to the West End, to the Fairview slopes. The, the rich ones went, of course, to Shaughnessy, and, and that's sort of the story of Vancouver in a nutshell, and the working class moving uh, progressively east, the white working class progressively east. So, Japanese Canadians moved onto Powell Street, and they took over these houses that had been vacated by white workers, and Actually, the majority of those houses are still there in some form, although they've been built over. So, um, this is just a couple of examples. This house was taken over, became a, a two stores, actually. It would be divided up. These are uh, Canadians uh, born. Um, this would be shortly after World War I, I think, by the time this was taken. Uh, they built down the alleyways. This is the only sort of um, uh, Japanese cultural symbolism that, that you'll see in the hundreds of stories. Uh, keep that in mind because something else will come up in a few minutes. And the Japanese boarding house union uh, was established very, very early as by the owners of, of all of these sort of entrepreneurial leaders who would bring lots of um, sponsored migrants to work, mainly in the mills, um, the open stores, and behind these buildings, they would build boarding houses. This one's been torn down. This one is still there. It used to have Fujia store in front of it when this um, when, when this uh, photograph was taken, this was a tofu shop. Lots of tiny, small rooms. The story is told that they, that several men would share one room. Uh, they would have bunk beds and they would work shifts, so they would rotate in and out of the, the bunks. There's also a story about how they slept in boxes that got piled on top of one each other because there wasn't room. And I've, I've never known for sure if that was just a story. Uh, but anyway, um, they took over, and then in some cases, um, here is a house on Alexander Street, and they simply built back, added on, um, added on um, apartments for families because these rooms were not. And I know that there are at least two people in this room whose families actually lived at this address. Roy? Grace? Yes. Um, and, um, and, and this property is gone. Um, and I was there on 
the day that it was torn down, and we went in and we found a lot of pieces of blue and white pottery in the dirt. Um, but I also remember that the building had deteriorated so much uh, that it was uh, very disturbing uh, to go inside. At this time, it was pretty well uninhabited. Um, but there couldn't be any worse housing anywhere in Vancouver that was found in these um, places before the city um, tore them down. Now, I wanted to stop there for a second because a lot of people came out and protested that these houses were being torn down, including quite a few Japanese Canadians. These places were no longer inhabitable. And I'll come to this in a minute, but there are places uh, in the downtown east side today that are arguably not inhabitable. Um, so when this picture was taken, uh, these, these apartments had not been lived in for a period of months. The city uh, condemned the buildings um, and tore them down. And they have since been replaced by new housing. As it happens, low-cost housing in this particular site. Uh, but this really represents a conjunction of all of the issues of taking uh, a relic landscape in the sense that it was a landscape that had been created uh, by one group after another, vacated for various reasons. And of course, the Chinese <coughs> um, vacated through dispossession. Um, and with each dispossession, <coughs> many of the buildings have deteriorated and being taken over by a variety of different mm -hmm. groups, public and private, once taken over uh, in, into public hands. And actually, the city of Vancouver owned and still owns a lot of property that had been expropriated since the 1940s. And that may be a good thing, maybe not. Um, in any case, just some random slides of Powell Street. Uh, and what it looked like in the early 20th century um, you'll see uh, Tamura House there to get an orientation. Uh, Oppenheimer Park is over here. This was the visit of the Crown Prince of Japan in 1930. <coughs> this was the the, uh, the Buddhist congregation. I don't need to describe all of the details to, to, for you to see that it was a, a thriving place that looked very similar to what it looks like today in, in most so, uh, all that, of course, came to a crashing end. Oh, um, just before I get to that, uh, nearby, um, these are pictures that just came to light uh, by, uh, on the part of our archival team um, in the last couple of days. I just got them this morning and I, I threw them in. Um, thank you, Magnus. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, Hastings Street in its heyday, and um, this is the, the bar at the Regent. <laughs> so, we can spend the rest of the evening deconstructing this group of guys. Two of them, uh, two of them I believe, are Japanese Canadian. One of the things that has come to light in our recent uh, archival mining uh, is that when we look at the business licenses that were issued in Vancouver uh, by the 1930s, I'm sort of moving ahead in time here, there were almost 90 Japanese Canadian proprietors of SROs in the downtown east side. It wasn't just Powell Street, it was uh, Powell Street and six or seven streets in, uh, in any direction from Powell Street. Quite a number of the buildings on Powell Street were actually built by Japanese Canadians. Uh, they were most of the, the buildings in the uh, larger area were built by uh, white entrepreneurs, and Japanese Canadians managed a lot of these uh, buildings. 
Uh, and that's something that's never really been recognized in all of the historical work that's been done on Japanese Canadians. Uh, and, and adds a whole new dimension to what was going on in the downtown east side in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and, and given Nick's um, interest in property, he and I have been discussing what does this mean in terms of property? What did people own? What happened to all those beds? Uh, who took them over? And this is all part of a bigger question, a sort of mega question, which is how does an SRO become an SRO? Uh, what is the story behind each of these buildings? And there is a fascinating story behind every building. Well, just very quickly, um, I believe most everybody in the room probably knows this story. I'm not going to tell it. Uh, except to say, after Pearl Harbor, uh, the, the um, notices started coming thick and fast. And um, over the next year, or it took about a year uh, or so, uh, everyone was removed from 100 miles of the coast and uh, registered, uh, sent away in trains to um, cold winters in the interior or to um, sugar beet farms on the prairies, that's where Jeff's family um, was sent uh, in a few cases to self-supporting camps, to road camps in the Rocky Mountains. And Kirsten and I have been working on those road camps, and some to prisoner of war, war camps. Um, okay, flash forward, 1988, um, here we are. Uh, signing the redress settlement uh, finally after all of these years and again I'm not going to say uh, much about that except just put a little halo around my face there. <laughs> uh, Roy if I know you were going to be here I'd have given you a halo too. <laughs> Roy is right here. Um, and, and this is the team that, that negotiated the redress settlement uh, and Art Mickey is here with the Honorable uh, Ryan Mulroney uh, signing the uh, agreement. So, um, there are so many stories. Um, Kirsten and Roy are actually working on, on, a, on a book of um, an edited collection on post-regress um, discussions. And the only thing that I really want to say about is that we had such huge dreams of human rights coming out of the redress settlement. Uh, now Roy has written more than anybody uh, about that period, about the process, about what it meant. Um, and I suspect, um, although I never asked him, I suspect that Roy probably would share some of my um, kind of disappointment um, that the redress settlement didn't have a lot more human rights staying power than it had, but that's a very big story. For some of us, um, I was actually just a little bit too young, so uh, I didn't receive a redress settlement. Um, but for some of us, that's really what it was all about. It was an expression of citizenship. It was an expression of finally uh, having an acknowledgement that people's homes have been taken away from not only their homes, all of their civil rights, all of their possessions, everything that they had except themselves and their families, which of course is tremendously important. But it also was a, a, a statement of what community means. And I don't want to talk anymore about what community meant in the past to Japanese Canadians. My whole point is to say this is a uh, a neighborhood with a, uh, a an amazing, rich past that is built upon a sense of community uh, that was pulled apart by racism, uh, by greed, uh, by a sense of difference, um, and um, I'm going to go very quickly because it's ten to eight. Um, I want to now turn to some of the things uh, that have been going on since. So, Powell Street today, this is actually a couple of years ago that this one was taken. These shots will be very familiar 
uh, too many people, and and you know I'm sure you've walked by and seen the Morimoto sign, um, all that's left of, of that store. And I don't want to just sort of depict that as oh as oh isn't it sad, uh, because that's often how this particular sign is read. Uh, yes, it is sad. It's a sad story. It's a tragic story. It's it's an outrageous story more than anything else. Uh, uh, but um, it needs to be understood in context. And the, con and the context is about a society in which uh, racism, oppression are operative on a daily level at a number of different levels. Um, and they have always been from the first moment that the Europeans arrived, uh, and certainly until today. I found it rather amusing that you have a culinary training society that has little lanterns. Okay. Uh, we'll see that in a second. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to have to move faster. Um, familiar shots. This is before Tamura House was uh, renovated. Um, and many of you will remember um, the occupation of Oppenheimer Park three and a half years ago, um, and all that it symbolized. And as a matter of fact, that summer, the Powell Street Festival uh, moved its main location um, to the east, away from where the tents were erected, and, and um, down Jackson Street, onto Cordova Street, and it, it's remained uh, in those locations. But this is just a collage. There's about five different pictures there showing um, one of the most cogent expressions of the right to home. Any one of these slides, I could give a whole talk on, so I'm having a little difficulty staying on schedule here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep trying to speed up. Okay, so along comes our Right to Remain project. And this has occurred in two phases. Uh, and that's the old logo. There is a new logo, which you saw on the first page. Um, so, with the Right to Remain project, we, we did a number of things, but the objective uh, was um, based on a grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada to raise awareness about what was going on in the downtown east side um, by starting with the experiences of people who live there and creating a place where people could express what it's like to live in the downtown east side um, initially through art. You'll see there the photo credit is Trevor Wyman. Trevor, there you are. You took that. <laughs> um, and people came together and they began to create. Uh, I'm just going to give you a sense of it because uh, I've got a whole bunch of slides here. Um, the project resulted in um, an exhibit which opened at Gallery Gachet, which may be familiar to many people here called The Right to Remain. And this photo was taken by Jeff's brother, Greg. Um, and it, it's a really wonderful photo. I'm not sure if you can actually catch the detail on the screen, but it shows people walking. It's actually on Hastings Street and the ghosts of Japanese Canadians behind them walking in their footsteps. Um, and to me that is tremendously symbolic because it, it points to the need to understand things in this historical context that I've been talking about. There were various attempts over the years, and those of you who are familiar with DERA will know that those go back to the 1980s. They have risen, they have declined, they have involved lots of colorful personalities, they have involved uh, lots of money and lots of politics. Uh, I won't even try to you know, fill in the um, 
details of, of that story. But over the years, there were various attempts to talk about something called revitalizing Japantown. Now, Japanese Canadians never called it Japantown. Uh, they just called it Powell Street in Japanese. It's Powell um, uh, Some people called it Little Tokyo, but that only applies actually in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, it wasn't Japantown, but that was the idea of a city government that could not see beyond the 1940s and somehow had this romantic idea that this was Japantown, that it had always been Japantown, that it was nothing else, and that it must be um, restored. Well, as a human rights issue, of course, you couldn't begin to restore Japantown. But they began, the planners uh, began to draw pictures of what it might look like. See this nice Japanese gate? There never was one there. <laughs> and this is a rendition of what Powell Street could look like and what the Powell Street Festival would look like. <laughs> Holy crow! <laughs> um, so this is, in case you don't recognize it, this is the corner of Powell and Jackson. And uh, so we're going to have these happy little kids in their traditional clothes running around. We're going to cook salmon, and we're going to have a brand new commercial landscape <laughs> that is going to have nothing to do with anyone who has ever lived on Powell's Green past or present. Well, that was 2014. We're not hearing too much about that right now. I'm sure Jean would have a lot to say about this. Uh, but. We called this project Revitalizing Japantown with a question mark. Unfortunately, we didn't make the question mark big enough. And uh, it kind of got misunderstood. But there's Greg's um, picture there. And here's a quote from the city. Relatively low rents and older unique spaces are very attractive to small startup entrepreneur, entrepreneurs in the new economy. Powell Street, Japantown will be revitalized as a retail center to reflect the unique heritage character of the area. Well, of course, all that has very little to say to do with what I've just been telling you, or with anything. Uh, except, of course, um, something that needed to be resisted, which was the inexorable process of gentrification. And so I'm going to go quite quickly through a whole series of uh, pictures of this art project. There's quite a few people in the room who, um, one person in particular who looks really goofy there and is in the room, but I won't say it. Uh, and um, we had postcards. We had different kinds of drawings. We had uh, buttons. Um, and uh, again, we could, all of these, all of these are expressions of home and community. That's the point. We don't have time to really get down and study all of them. You probably can't see the details on the screen anyway. But they're expressions of home and, uh, I mean, here is a house tumbling into the sea uh, because of the hammer of the gentrifier. These are ordinary people who have a very clear vision of what home means and of what the, the uh, neighborhood means to them. And, and, I, and that really is, is the point. People who, whose views are simply, well, thrown in the water. And they don't know what's going to happen. So, uh, some pictures. Uh, the Women's Memorial March. And this is the exhibit when it was first mounted. This is Gallery Gachi. Uh, I, I won't go into all the details of the kinds of discussions that took place, but they were actually quite profound. Um, where I, I'm pretty sure this is the bus that took people to Burnaby 
when the exhibit was mounted at the Nikkei National Museum, which was another attempt, is that correct, Trevor? Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Uh, Another attempt to uh, make a connection between Powell Street and the dispersed Japanese Canadian community. That's in Burnaby. A lot of the, the artist contributors sitting there on the stage. And hopefully some of you may be uh, familiar with some of the work. Okay. So, this is just about the end. Um, we sort of kept getting deeper and deeper into the issues. The whole group of people who was involved uh, received another grant and became um, closer partners with the SRO Collaborative. Quite a number of members of whom are here tonight. And realized that in order for the SRO Collaborative to do its job of, and Wendy, correct me if I don't say this properly, of um, Creating activism among SRO tenants um, to be aware of rights, to help to cultivate the conditions under which they could live those rights, and to improve conditions in the SROs that are there, but also to prevent the loss of more SRO rooms that are the basis of a vibrant community. Um, and the SRO Collaborative and a number of other organizations um, <coughs> as well as organizations uh, north on Pender, or, sorry, south on Pender Street and, and, and around the downtown east side have been uh, very involved in this collective uh, work in various ways. But the SRO Collaborative is really special uh, and really has behind it a um, and, and I have to mention Wendy personally because uh, if you don't know Wendy, she is the soul of the SRO Collaborative uh, and never stops, never stops going to City Hall, never stops uh, making connections um, to tenants, never stops uh, reading and studying and talking to people, uh, never stops doing the work that is leading to I hope I have to say is leading to um, changes and improvements um, in the downtown east side. So the second phase, which is just beginning, is carrying on the work that the art project did with uh, a much greater emphasis upon uh, enabling activism and quite a number of those activists I'm talking about, as I say, are in the room tonight, and this is, uh, I hope that I'm speaking for everybody uh, when, I, when I describe what this collective is doing. Uh, we've been involved in uh, extensive training, uh, in uh, collaborative uh, visits to the archive where we're unearthing massive amounts of material, some of which is actually changing our understanding of this uh, neighborhood. Um, we've started, just started to do interviews with uh, tenants in SROs, uh, but we're also um, organizing tenant activists, um, representatives in all of the buildings, and in particular, the worst buildings, um, but in all of the buildings, as many buildings as we can, we can't do all of them. Uh, but the other element um, is to write poetry. So we started out with art and then we moved to poetry. And we weren't quite sure how this was going to work, but the haiku, I'm sure you all did haiku when you were in school, grade three, grade four, grade eight. Well, that's not what it is. 
Uh, it is a vernacular tradition. It's one of the earliest forms of spoken word poetry. It has a very activist past. And the main point is that it's a vernacular form of expression. That nobody in Japan doesn't know how to make a haiku. Um, but at the time that Japanese immigrants first came to Canada, it was a very important exercise that actually was an important part of forming community. It was a tremendously important expression of human rights during uh, the 1940s when people were uprooted and dispossessed. So we thought, okay, maybe it will work here. Um, well, so we started putting together groups of people. Traditionally, the haiku is written in a group of five. It is supposed to be mutually inspirational and it's supposed to engage the environment. It's supposed to be kind of contemplative and almost spiritual, um, although it can also be a little bit raucous, and ours have been more raucous. <laughs> um, and so we began writing haiku collectively, and that's all I'm going to say. see your lines there. Um, and uh, so we continue on this process on the one hand of documenting, uh, of expressing, of building up capacity for change through activism, through people's own actions and words, uh, and, and what better way to do it uh, the haiku is, has become a vehicle, has become a form of expression that actually is, I think, has worked beyond our wildest dreams to, to, to do this job of pulling people together. Um, so if any of you want to come to one of the sessions, oh, one more. That was written two weeks, two weeks, three weeks ago. So Jeff went to a women's collective in Owen Sound, Ontario. And the women, we have a photograph, the women are sitting around the table and Jeff told them what we're doing in the downtown of East Side. And they said, let's write a haiku. And that's what they wrote. So, you know, this may go to Washington. <laughs> so, um, the Right to Me launch party is going to happen on Saturday at 1 p.m. And I hope to see, I know that I'm going to see at least half the people in the room there, but I hope to see uh, lots more as well. And the address is... One. One is one, one is one. One, East Hastings. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much, Audrey. Um, to the academics in the room, I think uh, Professor Nick Bowie, uh talked about all these amazing scholarship and leadership in the field as researchers. But I think what Audrey has made very clear is as researchers who are living in an era and working in an era where the words activism, social justice are thrown around um, and used sort of as uh, brands um, for us to get cultural capital, to get research grant. I think we have to really think about the work that Audrey, Nick, uh, Eugene, and Jeff, and other academics are doing 
where they're working in collaboration with people who know about injustice, who have the expertise to change the injustices in our city, in our country, and across borders. And it's this courage to work. And uh, before he came, uh, we had been with uh, Ramuki, Audrey, and Jeff. And Audrey was reminding us that it takes time to build those relations, takes collaboration, and the, the knowledge and the expertise, again, of people, for example, in the SRO um, group. So um, as an academic here, I want to thank all of you um, for your genius, for your work, and um, for, to Audrey for doing um, that type of instigation with the creative aspects, with the political aspects, and you really do need that creative, I think, to inspire. The high people are amazing, just amazing. They distilled not just words, but also the sense of injustice and hope. So thank you for that. Thank you. today is possible because a collaboration between the Department of Geography, um, Communications, Kwantlen Social Justice Center, and um, also the Center for Culture um, and uh, Policy Research on Culture and Communities, and obviously the uh, political front in Vancouver here. So um, thanks to everyone. Um, questions, comments? Um, Please, please uh, share your thoughts. Uh, if you have questions, um, stories, more high food, anything's welcome. <laughs> Audrey, can you tell us more about the Japanese boarding house union? What was that? Uh, it was an organized. It was a like a professional organization. That one was very early. It was uh, just after the turn of the century. And there were literally dozens of these converted houses. The actual um, SRO buildings, the ones that are three, four, five, six stories tall, um, like the Lion and Chamorro House, etc., were not built until after World War I. So uh, the early ones uh, all built these boarding houses and they formed an association, which is a very Japanese thing to do because they have associations for absolutely everything you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and um, they, they, as far as I can tell, uh, they were not terribly political. Um, I think that they were, they were partly social. Uh, but they also represented a kind of union. So there was a group called the Camp and Milk Workers Union, for example, that grew out of that early association. The first union office was uh, where the Sunshine Market is now, and that's way, way early. Um, but they were a little different from today's unions in that they were specific to particular work sites. And um, they were just more concerned with looking after the workers than with negotiating with the bosses. Um, that, that I think that that's mostly what they did. They looked after the needs of the workers. That they did negotiate salaries with the bosses, and they uh, collected the salaries. Uh, and the, the boarding houses were uh, directly related to the sawmills. And did you come across any, any detail about the boarding nature of those houses? There's a rooming function. Yep. And then serving, making and serving food as well? Yes. Um, one of the things I don't know uh, is the extent to which uh, there was ethnic mixing. So we know now that there were close to 90. Uh, scattered throughout the downtown east side. Um, only about 40 of them uh, were exclusively Japanese Canadian. 
Um, and what tended to happen was they were all organized according to prefectures in Japan. So every house um, had almost exclusively uh, in initially men from one part of Japan. So in the case of Shiga Prefecture, where, which I showed you at the beginning, there were lots of them because there were lots of men. And then gradually women became, uh, began to come. And one of the main reasons that the women came is that they needed someone to cook. So they had a system of arranged marriage, which every ethnic group at that time until World War I had. Um, and uh, the, the women would, I won't go into all the details of why they were picked or marriages, but uh, through an exchange of photographs, the, uh, the weddings were arranged. Women would get on a ship, often in groups, often very young women in groups, uh, would get off the ship in Vancouver, and the husbands would all be waiting. And uh, the next day, the women would be cooking in the boarding houses. Or if they were less lucky, they would be working in a white family's house on the Chaudhacy. Um, and so the women would be cooking, depending upon the size of the house, for anywhere from a dozen to 30 or 40 men um, every night, of course, uh, as well as doing all of the laundry and the things that women do. Um, and uh, there were also um, prefectural associations that formed the sort of back, backbone of the social organization of the neighborhood. And, but they were all organized around these houses um, that were, of course, nothing close to nuclear families. Um. Audrey, would be a point to make a general comment, which is meant to be positive. <coughs> Using the term SRO, <coughs> single room occupancy, yes. is something of a contradiction to much of what you're saying. In that, when you talk about a rooming house, even, but you talk about the relationship to the Groups of laborers and groups of yes, I see, uh, yeah. people from a certain area yeah. in Japan or anywhere else. Um, you have social relationships, even kinship relationships, where on the other hand, the single room occupancy is the opposite of that. That's one person in one box uh, in isolation. That doesn't mean you don't know the people down the hall even if it's because they all share the same toilet down the hall in some of the parts of the world. Okay. But there's a, so there are social and kinship relationships that are very important in weaving together what we going back to the rooming house idea, weaving together rooms and board and the common social Enterprise. Well, um, one other comment that you, you mentioned uh, one example where the people involved, there were a number of people sharing the, the same beds. To be, uh, and I've known situations like this. Uh, you might have 15 people in a house but it's really built and designed for five. And you don't have one bed in the bedroom, you have a bunk bed, you might have three or four things. Uh, but they're all working. And they're all busy, often on, on shift work. And the, in term you describe, what you describe, I have a term for it, called hot bedding. Yes. And it means that you're in the house and you have rights to sleep there, but you only have rights for eight hours a day. Yeah, and when you get back in the bed, it's still warm. Or when you get in and, the bed, it's still and warm. So that in itself is a, 
a social organization? Absolutely. Um, so, so, so one historic explanation and then a point. Um, so a great deal of transition occurred over time in these buildings, which I didn't go to in, into it in, in a lot of detail. Originally, they were these one and a half story clapboard houses uh, that were built for uh, a single white family who fled. Um, and those were transformed and they were built up and out and back. CJ. It's okay. Um, and um, so that they could house more and more, mostly single men. Um, in that respect, they were SROs, in that they were, uh, as time went on, they got their own rooms instead of having to share rooms. Um, and a lot of them, in fact, were boarding and there was somebody uh, cooking. We don't actually know how much cooking went on in the SROs in the 1920s and 30s that were all over the downtown east side. Um, but the buildings transformed. They got higher. They got more substantial. There were places like Tamura House that is very substantial, and even more so now that it's been renovated. So it did change over time from small little houses to larger hotel-like structures, and many of the buildings were formally hotels uh, by the 1930s. Um, but I really think that the SROs today are not as impersonal as you're suggesting. Uh, I think some of them are. Uh, I think there are a lot of different kinds of personal relations going on in the SROs. Um, the SRO Collaborative would like to um, foster the conditions under which people um, will be able to maintain a strong sense of community. Um, but I see suggestions that the downtown east side is not a community. What did you say? No, I know you didn't say that. Uh, but I would want to counter any such suggestions. Um, but certainly, what and you know, I personally don't um, don't live in an SRO in Vancouver. Um, but I think not only that there is a very strong community, but that there is potential for a stronger community if the antics of some words um, were changed, if there were a reasonable stock of um, low-cost housing where people could be assured that they could stay as long as they want to uh, without fear of being kicked out for various re reasons including demolition and gentrification. Um, so not only I think are there communities, but there is potential for much stronger community. Would you agree with that, Jeff? I would. Um, do you think there was a difference between uh, the boarding houses on Powell Street and the hotels in the downtown east side, which I've always been told um, were the homes for seasonal workers, right? And and so these were the men and women that built the province and, and the city, but would go out into the logging camps or go out on, on the boats um, and then return with their paycheck, which would immediately get cashed by the guy running the pub in, below the hotels. and. So um, it was likely to me a very, very separate, two separate communities almost, but I'm just guessing. No, actually I don't think there was a difference. Uh -huh. It was all about labor, and that's exactly what the Japanese immigrant laborers did. They came to Powell Street, they booked into whatever you call it, hotel, rooming house, boarding house, 
they were connected with, uh, they waited till they got the next job. And some of them lived there and went every day to the sawmills. Um, the difference <coughs> is uh, that gradually the Powell Street area um, was inhabited by a larger number of families than originally had been the case. Uh, but it was always all about labor. Um, and in that respect, I don't think that it is any different. Uh, in fact, we have some, a, a few accounts, uh, some poetry, uh, photographs uh, that show it, it really was not very different. It's about uh, labor, it's about temporary labor, it's about seasonal labor. Um, the ethnic backgrounds may have been different. Um, about where uh, there were a lot of loggers, for example, a lot of fishers of every background, mm -hmm. uh, but they were doing the same work. <coughs> so, yeah, yes, well, I just wanted to start by thanking you so much for your work and work with your collaborators. It's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic to learn about it. And I, I really enjoyed the way they presented it tonight, too. Um, my name is Margo, and I work with a small program at UBC that's devoted to people who live in this neighborhood. Um, it's been around for a long time, about 20 years, called Humanities One Work Community Program. Um, and, um, and I just want to really take up, I think, your similar um, question as well about what's about how researchers are approaching this neighborhood. Um, it's getting harder and harder to hold space for that for this program at this very large, very black field at the university, um, sort of harder by the minute, actually. Um, and at the same time, I'm doing some research now to find out what kind of research is being done in this community by universities. I've discovered that right now there's 74 currently active research projects, and that's by UBC Arts and Social Sciences alone. There's 640 academic papers of all different levels, many of them published. Uh, there are countless community engagement placements here. I think there's 2,000 university students that come here during the reading alone. And there's a special kind of conduit for UBC researchers here, which is called the Learning Exchange, which has as one of its primary responsibilities, you know, uh, channeling researchers from the university. I, I'm trying to get access to the numbers for the clinical studies that are being done here, but it's really kind of like breaking into what box to get that the behavioral research ethics boards don't keep tallies, or if they do, they, they say that they don't. So it's really, uh, it's really, really astonishing. The reciprocity is just not there. So the, this tiny, uh, tiny program, uh, now there's maybe about a thousand people in, in our community who have been involved, but lots of alumni remain involved, and, and are enmeshed with all the different things that fall on in this vibrant community. But, the, but, but they are so heavily researched. So well, I, I just have one line. Um, there was a wonderful woman named Tracy who died recently. And um, she used to make bannock. And lots of people in the room knew her. And Tracy had a favorite line. Nothing about us without us. Uh, so I would just apply that line. I don't know if anyone has applied to that line to all of those thousands well, in of In fact, it's used. All of these things are appropriated by the university knowledge production system. So I guess what I'm, what I'm um, saying is it's so fantastic that your work is an exemplar of a very, very different way of going about it. But I'm also, I guess, just really interested to talk to other people who are here uh, or really at any time about what we can do about this flood. It's it's what's called, it's resource extraction. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a resource extraction mm -hmm. process. And the universities are facilitating all of them. Mm -hmm. That's staunching. And I know from talking to people at Brev that they have no money for staff to actually police the ethics that go through. So mm -hmm. we, so something could go through and see what's funny. Of course, the research ethics boards are necessary in order to get these ways, especially when they go your pants. But there's no way to police them. So I, I don't know if there's some. Anyway, I'm just throwing out the idea about 
what we could do. We would just get together and maybe form a small collaboration to try to think through how to how to address this. Because I don't think it's going to come from the universities. Mm -hmm. No, 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 I think you're absolutely right, you know. What can we do? We can res resist. It has to be done differently. Yeah. Or else go away. That simple. Yeah. Do it do it different, do it better, or go away. And it's not about you. <laughs> That's what has to be said. Do you have cars that you can show yeah. 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 yeah, that would be the case with me. Thank you for that. I just I don't want to lose that thread, but I wanted just to come back to the SRO point. You mentioned David Lay's mm -hmm. map. I, I remember seeing the map um, uh, in, what was it? I think it was the, um, the, uh, the identification. Yes. Uh, in which he, he actually documented yes. the rooming houses in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's important to note that because what we see in downtown East Side is, is the, the relics of of that ring of hotels and rooming houses, Grandview Slopes, downtown south, west oh, absolutely. end. Absolutely, all along Second Avenue. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So, so, so there's a tendency to think of the, of the SRO as some sort of aberrant form yeah. of, 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 of housing, but it, and of course it, it has become because of the way in which it's been under-resourced and, and forgotten about and, and people, uh, uh, but, but historically and, and they were- Marple, and Quitlam, of course, and yeah. U.S. Minster, yeah, they were all the lot Lots of people yeah. uh, living in that sort of house, in those sorts of homes and housing. So it was just an observation. So. Yeah, no, ab absolutely it was. Uh, of course, it, it was a, uh, based on a different uh, economy, yeah. you know, different yeah. forms of housing. Um, but when you start to look at how that shift occurred and what happened to people in the process, that's when the questions <coughs> start to come. Yeah. Downtown, yeah. I mean, downtown South, not long ago. Yes. Had a large population of people. Absolutely. Um, around the mills. Yeah. Yeah, that would be quite believable. And the city, the city was um, going to redevelop the downtown south to be an adult-only community. That was the plan. <laughs> I, I suppose, but I mean, they really meant that there was going to be yeah. no uh, schools, right. no, <laughs> no, no children. Yeah, uh, I, I get the sense that a lot of those condos that were built right along the Fraser. Uh, that's basically what they are. Fraser, you mean the bird? I, I mean, Paul Street. Uh, oh, sorry, downtown South. Right. Yeah, you're talking about Vancouver. I was. Oh, uh, you said downtown South, and I heard Vancouver. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Similar. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a question? Audrey, I'm curious that um, in, in your experience in hearing the labor forces that you're talking about, I'm thinking like, oh wow, that's old school precarious labor. Oh. Yeah. And we flash forward today yeah. in our discussions about you know the precarious laborers today, and not all, not at least you know what we call SROs, uh, rooming houses, and the desire to create micro streets. And oh yes. Curious your thoughts on how they parallel from this discussion of early nineteenth, uh, early nineteenth, you know, late eighteenth century kinds of labor and housing, and flash forward today in really the nature of precarious employment. Millennials, I'll mention them now, and also microspeeds. And how are there parallels? Are there some? And indeed, the state of real estate in, in Vancouver. Are there parallels, or are they a totally different animal from what you see in your business um, In a sense, the micro suites have always been there. The new ones would be um, much more upscale. <laughs> Twelve hundred bucks a month. Huh? Twelve hundred bucks a month. Twelve hundred bucks a month. I mean, I remember what I lived in when I was a student in Kitsilano, in Fairview, and in the West End. Uh, and at that time in the West End, there were almost no high rises. There were some ritzy five or six story places right around Stanley Park. And then a whole bunch of old, falling down, dilapidated houses where one could rent a room as a student or as a precarious worker, either one. Um, and they, those were the houses that had been vacated by the people who moved on to 
um, better housing, and then of course you know what happened in the West End. So um, I think that process has been going on forever in Vancouver. Um, but, but one of the questions is, uh, the micro suites, uh, the very idea is uh, much more financially exploitive. Um, so you can get 1200 bucks for a micro suite. Um, and uh, most people who live in the downtown east side have 375. So obviously they're going after the millennials, a very different demographic. They're going after the hipsters uh, for whom uh, this neighborhood has lots of cachet. Uh, and living in a micro suite has a certain amount of cachet. Uh, depending who you are and which suite it is, okay? Um, so, um, the question is, I, I mean, it's interesting, given that I'm able to take a hundred year look back, uh, what are those micro suites going to look like in 20 or 30 years? I don't know. I have no idea. But I can see it going in a number of potential directions. Um, so is it about housing? Is it about home? Is it about community? Or is it about money? It's all of those things. Um, but I think it's pretty hard to establish community on a micro suite concept. But I, one last question is, given the kind of period that you've seen it change from the 70s to the present, um, would you have a prediction for what the next 30, 40 years Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a remarkable well, I mean, look, look what happened around the time of the Olympics. Yeah. Okay? A um, lot of people lost their homes. Yeah. Um, so all it takes is one mega event. Right. Um, downtown South. Look what happened at the time of Expo. A lot of people lost their homes. So um, there are certain forces that that create change very quickly around these big civic projects. Um, MPA. Uh, yeah. <laughs> MPA. That's all you have to say. Okay. Uh, um, and and it's deeply political, of course. So yeah, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't even want to guess. <laughs> Except that the forces of neoliberalism continue and grow stronger. <laughs> yes, there was a question in the back. Oh, thank you for the talk. Uh, could you explain the meaning of making haiku in the context of um, in the context of a political struggle or social struggle a little bit more? Um, I mean, I'm wondering how you think uh, poetry could connect to uh, political economy. Well, let me let me give you one example of a haiku that was not written in Vancouver. There's it, it, haiku is very popular, has been used for many uh, reasons: political, therapeutic, community, religious. Anyway, um, about a year and a half ago, an election happened in the United States. And someone wrote a haiku, which I shall recite for you. It's very short. 17 syllables. <laughs> lie, 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 lie. Lie, 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 lie. Lie, 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 lie. <laughs> um, so, is that is that political? Did that have any political impact? I don't know, but it's really funny. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, the haiku, well, I don't, I, won't, I don't want to give too many details. The haiku originated um, in Bushido, the way of the warrior, but it developed uh, throughout the Meiji period. And by the end of the Meiji period was a very important vernacular expression in Japan. Um, so, when it was
taken up in Canada, it was in that Meiji period uh, tradition, not the early, early tradition going back to um, the 12th and 13th century. And um, my grandfather, in fact, was a haiku, what they call a haiku master. And um, one, of, one of the leading poets in Canada. He um, went to the um, camps in the interior of Bridgeville. He was given a special dispensation for the um, And he conducted haiku circles. And it was that that sort of gave, that's, that's sort of what gave me this sort of understanding of how it could be political. Uh, there's a lot of very political haiku written in the camps in the 1940s. Uh, but more than that, is all, there's a kind of um, a sense of community because of the way that it's done. Uh, the whole community where I grew up, which is what was in the interior of BC, revolved around the what you would call a haiku club or a haiku kai in Japanese. Uh, that was what people did on a Saturday, but it was also the way that they came to terms with political um, events, with loss, with celebration, with almost anything that went on at the day of the cadence of life. Um, and so, you know, if it worked in, in that context, um, it could work politically, um, and it wouldn't necessarily be so, but it can work politically if you recognize that it's not about poetry. If poetry means some person going off in solitude and being inspired and writing words and publishing them, which is all right. Uh, I wouldn't uh, challenge that whatsoever, uh, but it's not about the high poet. It's about ordinary people. Um, in groups, solidifying a sense of community. So it's politics from the bottom line. And there's a long, long history that shows that that's how it's worked. So could work here too. Yeah, I just want to go back to Andy's question uh, with a comment, actually, or actually a, a prediction. Oh, okay. uh, it's a really good question. <laughs> My mind, Maybe I'm, Andy has the answer. <laughs> uh, somebody, who did have, somebody who did predict the future. Yeah. Um, listen, I'm just going to quote them. Now, this person offers a fairly pessimistic quote. I must confess that, uh, lawyers, uh, to considerable pessimism as to the likelihood of any considerable improvement in conditions in the immediate future, these places are, of course, built as investments and the high value of suitable sites together with the high price of labor, this is talking about the building of new housing, and material render the greatest economy in space and construction imperative, otherwise the rents charge would be prohibitive in these days of high cost of living. An increased cost of living necessitates increased salaries, and this again discourages the investment of capital and the establishment of new industries, which we are told are necessary for the building up of the greater rent that it is to be. In brief, the whole matter opens up another phase of the age-long conflict of humanitarian and altruistic effort as against vested interests, property rights, and the doctrine of laissez-faire. Signed, J.G. Morgan, 1913. Well, you got that. I mean, the present day and the future of the SROs. And I'm really grateful that uh, I think there's a complete role for the academia because I'm learning a ton and the community's learning a ton through this lens, not only the historical lens, but the practical lens, the archives, and also the political reality and the policy <coughs> solutions that we could be looking at to preserve them as historical and affordable and communal spaces for people to live in. So, um, yeah, like very practically, the laws at the city aren't enforced. Yeah. So 
there is a standards maintenance bylaw, and it, the city doesn't in, in, enforce their own bylaw. So we, there's practical work to be done, and um, so we're learning. And and there there'll be lessons in history like that. <laughs> And it is going to be about the struggle for the future. When we take haiku to City Hall. Yeah. And I write it on a mattress. <laughs> we did take a mattress to City Hall. The <laughs> tax <Next> mattress. Yeah. <laughs> that the rats had eaten bolstered. Other comments? Other questions? So I think there's a message here for us as academics. You need to be careful of us, the ones that are parasitic, and <laughs> foster and sort of, you know, have high expectations of those of us who can collaborate, take the time to build relations. You know, I think that's really important. Final comments? Let's thank 